Welcome to this, this evening's session on health span and vitality. We are doing an extension of our hormone vitality sessions. Dr. Karen and I were very happy to discuss the last two sessions, really covering perimenopause and menopause, um, what to expect during those years. And we also specifically targeted hormone replacement therapy and the, the benefits and also the history of the studies and where people thought there were more risks than there actually are and all the other things that are associated with it. So if you haven't watched those, and if you are a woman <laughs> nearing in that, that period, go ahead and have a look there on YouTube. For tonight, we are talking about what we can do to en enhance our hormone vitality, which is also all the same things to enhance our health span. So that's what we're focusing on tonight, how we are going to improve our health span, which is the quality of our years. It's not only lifespan, it is being healthy for as long as possible. So I am so happy to welcome Dr. Karen Hartzenberg joining me once again. Thank you, Dr. Karen, for joining. Thank you. So just a quick introduction, as not everyone on this call has joined the previous ones. I am Lindsay Kassam. I am a health coach. It is my passion to help people become more energetic and empower them to live a life with more peace, more energy, more health, more vibrance and more self-love. And I help a lot of mainly working with executives, helping them with anxiety, burnout, hormone, health symptoms, getting peace that they may have never had and energy that they haven't had in years. And as we're going through this phase in midlife, this is one of the busiest times of our lives. So it is just a pleasure to be able to, to, to support those people. And Dr. Karen, I'll let you introduce yourself. Fantastic doctor to work with. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, so I'm a medical doctor in private practice in Mauritius. Um, my postgraduate qualification is in a field called lifestyle medicine, which focuses more on preventive health care and promoting health to optimize wellness and well-being. Um, and so I think Lindsay and I have got really the same kind of ethos in terms of helping people to reach their, their greatest health potential. Um, I do a bit of aesthetic work as well, making people look lovely. Uh, and then on the side, I teach group fitness. Um, so again, passion for helping people be as healthy and vital as possible. And I'm delighted to be here. And with every course that I've done with Lindsay, I've learned a tremendous amount from her. And I'm so grateful that we can you know, collaborate and share with you some interesting information and knowledge. Thank you. Okay, so now we get started. Um, as I mentioned, this is what we can do to support hormones and health span in general. You can ask questions in the chat anytime and we'll answer them either throughout or at the end, depending on depending on everything. Now, this is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. And this is, we're not gonna go through each of these in this slide, but I'm going, we're gonna go through each of these. And there's a lot here. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that you need to do everything all of the time. But if you're interested to know more about the top things you need to know tonight, today, you are going to find those out. So there's a lot of cool hacks, different things that you may not have known. And what I'd like you to do is just to take a piece of paper out. And I don't want you to, you can take as many notes as you want, but also if you're not doing a lot of these things, it can be very overwhelming to try to do all of them. So what I really want you to do is at the end of your notes, just circle one or two top things that you're doing, and then maybe make a note to rewatch this replay three to six months from now and really start on the next one. And then obviously if you need support and enhancing any of these, then just give me a shout. But it's it's essential not to try to do all of these at once. At the end of the day, we're trying to increase health span. And part of that is to reduce overwhelm. So one thing at a time and do what, what suits you. I think, you know, during the, the perimenopause and menopause time, a lot of people focus predominantly on the hormone aspect. But we forget that our hormones are produced from raw materials that come from what we eat. And there's growing evidence and research about the power of nutrition for improving not only your physical well being, but your mental and psychological well being as well. And so, one of the tools that I recommend a lot to my patients is something called the healthy plate. And I know Lindsay uses something very similar for her clients. And it's really a model of what we should be eating on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that we have all the nutrients and we get optimal nutrition for overall well-being and also for the production of things like hormones as well as neurotransmitters. So how it works is if you imagine that this is your plate 
and you divide it into various sections. So divide in half, divide in half again, and then divide the last quarter into half again. At least half, so 50% of what you eat on a day-to-day -day basis should really be vegetables, plant-based, fresh produce, and preferably locally produced, not with pesticides and toxins and other stuff, um, if possible, because that provides you with a lot of fiber that helps with your gut microbiome and also obviously vitamins and minerals that are necessary for hormone production. Plus or minus 20 to 25% of your plate should be protein-based foods. So like animal-based proteins, meat, chicken, fish, eggs, dairy products fall into that category, as well as plant-based proteins like soy, tofu, lentils, pulses, etc. And during the perimenopausal phase, protein is particularly important because a lot of the times we lose muscle mass during that time and having enough protein tends to help with maintaining those muscle tissues. The third section that's very important and often neglected is healthy fats. And I think most of us have this sort of fear of eating fat because we've been told that fat makes you fat, you know, and cholesterol causes heart disease and all of these things have been disproven. And so the new recommendations uh, that we should be having at least 10 to 15% of our calories from healthy fats like avocado, olives and olive oil, nuts and seeds, coconut, coconut oil, and dark chocolate falls into that category as well, which I think makes people very happy most of the time. Um, and then finally, carbohydrates. This is a, a big disputed topic. My personal feeling is that we eat way too many carbohydrates in general. And carbs are not great because they push up your insulin level and that can increase belly fat, which is obviously a challenge for many women around the perimenopause. So if we can try and counter that by reducing the amount of carbs to between 10 and 15% of what we're eating, that helps a lot. And making smart carb choices. So trying to eliminate any processed and refined carbohydrates is your first prize. Um, anything that's white, I usually say to my patients, please avoid. So refined white flour, white sugar, white rice, all of these carbohydrates do not have any beneficial nutritional value for you besides digesting into sugar. So rather go with the unrefined grains and pulses and things that provide you with some additional protein and fiber and vitamins and minerals so that along with the energy, you are getting some nutritional benefit. And then finally, making sure that we are well hydrated. Obviously, depending on your climate, your level of activity, um, we all need different amounts of hydration. But in general, if you hydrate yourself well, then when you go to the bathroom, your urine should be a nice, clear, pale yellow color with no nasty odor. And then you know that you're well hydrated. So this is kind of the model that we use for optimal nutrition. And that's regardless of health problems. You know, I, I give the same advice to my patients who've got diabetes, high cholesterol, arthritis, whatever, and perfectly healthy people can try to follow this routine as well. Lindsay, you kind of explain a similar model, I guess, to most of your clients too. Yeah, it's very similar. And I think with with journaling, um, because I, in part of my program, I do a nourishment journal, which helps people really understand what, when they change this up a little bit, what's their energy like, they get more attuned. And so for the majority of people, something like similar to this or similar to mine, they're very close, uh, would work. And for others, they need to tweak it slightly, but most people end up seeing that something directionally correct like this actually works better for them, uh, once they build up, because obviously if someone's not eating many vegetables a day, and then they go to six in one day, that can be hard on, on a person in the toilet for those few days adjusting to the increased fiber content. But then after a while, they actually feel a lot better. They're a lot more regular, their energy is higher, all of these things start to improve once they eat similar to this, especially before and after a fast as well. But yes, it, this is, um, this is very similar. I want to say also that herbs are not on here. They're not on mine either, but herbs and spices have a load of anti-inflammatory benefits and all other sorts of benefits that um, if we add those to the food, there, there are a ton of things and we won't have time today to go through all the benefits, but add your herbs and spices. Those are fantastic and see how you feel. The other piece is quality. Um, you mentioned about the organic. There's also 
I do see a difference in my clients and how they feel when they're having, if, if they're eating animal products that where the cows are eating the grass, how cows are supposed to eat versus, I mean, when you look at the cow's inflammation with a cow who is eating grass versus a cow who is eating uh, genetically modified grains, there is a huge difference in their omega-3 content and how inflammatory the, the cow is. And so I do see a, some of my clients who had told me they could not tolerate meat when they do eat grass-fed meat. It's better. Wild fish, um, pasture-raised chicken, those sorts of things. When you have higher quality animal products, um, you people do see more benefits as well. So quality is also key. I mean, there's also certain types of cinnamon. There's all sorts of things you could go into the quality of each food, but as much as you tra can try to get higher quality, because the more quality we put in, what you get, what you put in, you get out. And, and we see that in our health big time. And I think that's quite a, an important point. Like people complain to me and they say, well, eating healthy is so expensive. But the, the cost that you have of dealing with health complications as a result of having a lot of unhealthy food and toxins and that kind of stuff is so much more, not only from a perspective of, you know, the financial implication, but also just your quality of life. Um, yeah. And so I agree with you 100%. Right. So it's worth the investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's, there's scientific, everything has scientific evidence that we're talking about here. Some things are you know, food, fasting, those types of things. Other stuff is going to be related to breathing, meditation, and rest. So I'm going to share a few scientific or random guys control trials, some scientific evidence on some of these things, but a meta-analysis is basically a compilation of studies and breath work, people who are doing deep breathing on a daily basis. And there's all sorts of breathing that can benefit. And I'll probably be posting more on one type versus another because there have been some comparative analysis of different types of breathing. But at the end of the day, if you're getting more oxygen in and you're taking this deep breath in and you're sighing out or you're exhaling, you are getting more oxygen in your cells. That is going to improve your health. It's getting you more into this, what we call a parasympathetic state, which is your rest and calm state versus the sympathetic nervous system state, which is your emergency room. And really we should be in the emergency room, this paras or sorry, the sympathetic state, only two to 5% of our life and the parasympathetic state, 95 to 98% of our life. And a lot of people have this blipped. So breathing is one of the fastest ways to get you into a, a better stress response. It helps with so many other things, not only anxiety and mental health, but so many other health benefits as well. Now onto meditation, long-term meditation, meditators also have better stress response. And there's some connection with the brain, prefrontal cortex is your logic and thinking and planning. The amygdala is where you process your emotions and the connection between the two is enhanced. Brain size is enhanced. So many benefits from this, but don't worry if you don't meditate or you don't like meditating. Um, I do convert skeptics to, <laughs> to meditation because there are different types of meditation. Um, but at the same time, there are different types of ways that we can just rest our, our minds because in this day and age, we, everyone is busy. Everyone is fully busy with hundreds of things that they're doing and it, nobody ever feels like there's enough time, but we really need to sometimes just sit on the couch or sit in a chair or lay in a bed and literally just do nothing for a little bit of time. It's really good for the brain just because we're, our mind is overactive in today's age. So these are the benefits of meditation, stress, immunity, quiets, mind chatter, boost positive thinking, reprograms the subconscious mind, mentioned rest. The other thing I want to say is prayer has very similar benefits to meditation as well. So if you don't do meditation, but you do prayer, you're, you're benefiting just the same. Exercise and movement. So, so all of these, oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I think this is one of the most powerful medications that we, we have at our disposal um, because it's one of those things as humans, we are engineered to move, you know? Um, and I think if, if a person is living a sedentary lifestyle and sitting for between eight and 10 hours a day, which a lot of people do, this increases your health risk to the same degree as if you were smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Um, so, you know, the key is to try and move throughout your day in order to decrease your, your health risk. And we know that exercise reduces the risk of cardiovascular events like heart attacks, et cetera. We know that exercise helps with general metabolism, so it improves diabetes. We also know that, especially like relevant to the menopause and perimenopausal time, that exercise is one of the most powerful ways to improve 
your bone strength and your bone integrity and to prevent injuries. Um, obviously, weight management, big benefits there because of the metabolic effects of physical activity. And what I really enjoy about exercise is that it increases the oxygen supply to your brain. And so you feel much more alive, your concentration, your focus is better, and it certainly improves cognition and mood. And for sure, it helps with your sleep quality as well. So it's one of those things that I, I actually prescribe to patients and give them you know, ideas of what they can do to improve their physical fitness and move more. Just another reinforcement of why it's so great to work with a doctor like you who is very holistic in your approach because a lot of uh, doctors are only prescribing medicine. So it's really just such a relief. I get that feedback from everyone who comes to see you. Okay, so I wanna talk about a few different things with strength training and cardio because what the studies have always shown cardio, you get a higher VO2 max, which is your volume of maximum oxygen that your cells get. And basically a higher VO2 max also reduces your uh, mortality risk by five times. Uh, and also I want to say VO2 max as someone who has a high VO2 max also has high correlation to a, a few extra years of life. So there, there are some really big benefits to getting good VO2 max with cardio though. There's a lot of interesting studies and a lot of science, new science that's been coming out. So zone two cardio is what they've always pretty much recommended 150 minutes. Now, some studies are showing even 200 minutes per week. Zone two means 60 to 70% of your max heart rate, which is like low intensity, but basic endurance pace without intervals. You are going to be slightly out of breath while exercising. So you can still have a conversation, but you're going to be out of breath. That's the general recommended amount of cardio for increasing VO2 max. But recent years, they have had two different types of exercise that have been up and coming. And they do see that there are benefits because not everyone wants to do this long-term cardio. Not everyone is built for it. And they're seeing the high intensity interval training, which also increases VO2 max. Something new came out, which is called rehit, which is your reduced um, exertion, high intensity training. And that is basically, I mean, it's so small that it's surprising and it's shocking that it actually does something, but two or three 20 second sprints in a 10 minute period. So you'd have like three minutes of rest. And what they would see is VO2 max increases. They're seeing a huge benefit. I think they are, the studies still are showing that um, high intensity interval training is still better than rehit, but I, I think that may change the more they, they're trying to experiment with different types of rehit. And the reason why they're seeing this is because of the huge drop in glycogen, which is your, your sugar stores in your, in your liver or in your muscles. And what happens is that this also improves your VO2 max and your insulin sensitivity, and you get the rest in the recovery period, not necessarily during the workout itself. And it's the amount of recovery that your body is still doing, needing to recover. It's as if you've had a big stressor, 20 seconds, you had to run and the body's doing all the work to recover over the, the subsequent days. And without the discomfort of a lot of exercise. So people are trying to biohack and get better at exercising, more efficient. A lot of people are saying, I don't have this time to exercise. So what I want to say here is if you're already doing cardio and you like your zone two cardio and you, and that works for you, keep doing that because that's been studied the most. However, if you are short on time and you are probably going to deprioritize your workout, I would definitely do one of these. Um, because there are studies that show that it does benefit. From a practical perspective, it's really handy because if, if you do have like a desk job or something, and literally you can get up from your desk, do 20 minutes or 20 seconds of sprinting, and then three of those sessions and you, you're done for the day, or you quickly run up and down the stairs a couple of times and that's it. And it does make a huge difference. I think not only to, to the VO2 max and stuff, but also just to general energy level so i'm not sure if i'm frozen or dr karen is but let me just check karen are you with us okay well we'll see when she comes back um the strength training also helps reduce the risk of heart attack stroke or death just one to three hours a week they found that four hours a week doesn't move the needle much so and also it reduces diabetes risk by 32 percent. so it's huge there um, can anyone put in the chat if they can still hear me? I just want to make sure that my connection did not go out. Okay. 
And then the other thing is we want to walk at least 7,500 steps per day. That's what's actually been studied. Great, Debbie. Thank you. That's what's actually been studied as the minimum number of steps. 10,000 was an arbitrary number, but it is, it, it's 7,500. It's what's been studied. Okay. The other thing I want to mention is functional medicine support, which is, sorry, functional movement support, not functional medicine. Functional movement is just making sure you, if you've got any injuries or any issues, this is something I need to work on because sometimes my back gives me an issue. Functional movement is where you have an expert really understanding if you've got any any mobility issues, any muscle imbalances, anything that could be causing energy, any movement issues where you're maybe even your gait, your walking movement is wrong. If you've got someone, an expert in your area who can do this and help maybe even with, with exercise as well, uh, an exercise physiologist, something like that, this is going to be also beneficial to prevent injuries and, and prevent you from actually doing these exercises. Okay, I just, Dr. Karen, you're back. I'm sorry, I dropped out. <laughs> no, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So um, I covered I covered for the rest of you. I just wanted to make sure you were there. You want to cover this one? So this is one of my big passions um, is intermittent fasting. And again, I prescribe this as a medical intervention for many health conditions. And the benefits are tremendous, um, not only from a metabolic perspective, because you've got a lot more fat burning and metabolic efficiency, but also because of the effects on hormones and the benefits for anti-aging. So if we look at like hour by hour benefits of intermittent fasting, once you stop eating within 48 hours, you are using up your blood sugar and your glycogen stores so that your insulin level drops. And at some point you've got to switch over to using fat stores for energy. So that typically will happen after about 12 hours of fasting when you enter into ketosis and you're using fat for energy. Fantastic, because it helps specifically to break down abdominal and stubborn fat stores. Um, also at about 12 to 14 hours, you have an increase in what we call human growth hormone, which is responsible for keeping your bones and your tissues in good condition. So that helps you to preserve your muscle mass as well. So from a weight loss perspective, this is really a fantastic intervention because you are not losing muscle tissue when you're doing your fasting. Um, we see good digestive benefits as well because you're allowing your digestive system to rest. And that has got benefits from the perspective of the microbiome and rebalancing the good bacteria and for regeneration of the gut lining so that you get more absorption of your nutrients. By about 16 hours, your ketosis is well established and you'll be burning fat very well for energy. And by about 18 to 20 hours, a process called autophagy kicks in. And this is like the spring cleaning mechanism of the body because you're not getting energy and nutrients into the system. You've got to find those raw materials somewhere else. So what the body does is that it looks for old, broken down, bedraggled kind of cells. It breaks them down and recycles those cells to make new cells or to regenerate tissues. So you end up eating into old, tired, broken cells and potentially dangerous cells like cancer cells and using those for regenerating new cells. And this is where the anti-cancer and the anti-aging benefit kind of kicks in. And that you can only achieve really with a slightly longer fast. Um, for people who are really excited about fasting, you can prolong that to 36 or 72 hours to really reap the benefit of the autophagy. But for most people, I think going to about 18 to 20 hours is pretty good. Um, so it's one of those things, like I say, that I use in my practice almost on a daily basis where I'm recommending that people try out fasting, see if it works for them. And it can, for many people, be very powerful in terms of energy levels, concentration, cognition, and like I said, weight loss and body metabolism. Yes. And I think the, and when we think about the other benefits of fasting, there's also not only reduced inflammation, but people report higher mental clarity. There's also spiritual benefits. I remember when I was younger, my dad would fast for 
for spiritual benefits. And I remember thinking, why would you ever just not eat? And it just didn't make sense. And then as I get to health and spirituality and all these things, you know, I, I get all of that now, but I just couldn't fathom going without food because I thought it was torture. But in my uh, coaching program, Dr. Karen and I actually have a fasting course where we do teach fasting the right way uh, because there are wrong ways to fast and ways that would, would create headaches and fatigue and um, dizziness and all the things that some people get when they fast. And also, you know, there's certain ways to eat for fasting. And it's also never just jumping into a fast. If you're not, if you're not ever really used to fasting, then going right to the 18 to 22, 20 hours would be quite intense and heavy for someone. And they won't actually have any energy because their body's not used to burning fat for fuel yet. It's like a muscle we build. And over time, if you kind of increase your fast steadily, then you'll be able to burn that fat for fuel because you won't have any sugar for fuel from your food and you won't have any fuel from fat. So you have no fuel. And this is why people have these crashes. So it's really important to make sure that you're doing it properly. And then Debbie asked, how often do you recommend fasting for 72 hours in a year? Most experts are recommending um, one of those every three months to every year for men. For women, it's it really depends. Some women, that is actually too long, um, especially it would disrupt their hormones. So there are some experts that say that women can can do that, but most women would have a, a hard time with the hormones to do that. And I don't know if Dr. Karen, you've you have any comments on the 72 hour fast for women? I've got a few patients who, who do like ladies who do a 72, even slightly longer fast up to five days, twice or thrice a year. But it's true. It's, it's hard and you've got to really be used to fasting for longer periods of time in order to be adapted to ketosis very well, to embark on that kind of prolonged fast. Um, so I, I don't recommend prolonged fasting for women generally, usually like 24, maybe up to 30 hours it would be my maximum, simply because then oftentimes it affects bone density if you're fasting for longer periods of time frequently, you know? Yeah. She also asked, does postmenopausal make a difference? It's often easier for women, but then you've got to also look out for the bone density piece. Mm. Okay. Sleep. I, I'm not going to spend, because there's a lot of other things I want to go through. I won't spend too much time on sleep, but obviously sleep is important. And this is for some experts, sleep is, if we go through anything, this is the number one longevity hack is, is proper sleep every night. That's going to bed consistently. Um, so you can see sleeping less than seven hours is associated with all of these things, weight gain, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, depression, increased pain, impaired immune function, impaired performance, impaired brain function, greater risk of death. That's from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and sleep research society. So the more things you can do to get on a consistent schedule to reduce stimulation, blue light, which blocks the release of melatonin, which is your hormone that actually gives you high quality sleep. If you start doing all the sleep habits, this is important, but I have a sleep program in my coaching program that helps people. There's a guided meditation using the techniques of hypnotherapy. There's the techniques that are taught. And all of this has helped a lot of people sleep. With that said, two exceptions. One, if hormones, if someone is, um, perimenopausal or menopausal and their hormones are declining, that sometimes can be what is causing the sleep issues. And no matter what you do sleep wise, you could do all the things. This is actually something that needs to be addressed, which we've talked about in the last two sessions. And this, the other thing is stress. If you've got major stressors in your life that aren't really, uh, you're not able to kind of put them away and as if you know, you're know you folding laundry and the laundry basket is next to your head while you're asleep, you're not able to like let them go and be where they are and close the day without thinking about them, this is gonna keep you up at night and this is gonna cause a lot of higher cortisol, which is a hormone that will keep you awake. So that's that's really the gist on sleep. I think that for many people, this is quite a, a challenging uh, topic is to eliminate the toxins. Um, certainly in my practice, uh, I'd say probably 40 to 50% of the adults who I see are either drinking regularly or smoking regularly. Um, and it certainly has an important role to play in general health and well being, um, but also from a hormone perspective. Because remember that specifically alcohol is a toxin that needs to be metabolized by your liver. And your liver is responsible for also metabolizing your hormones. And so if you're introducing a toxin, 
your liver is going to prioritize metabolism of that toxin and try and clear it out and get rid of it, which then is going to compromise the balance potentially of your hormones and your metabolism. So this is something that I think one needs to think about it. And um, it was what dry January for a lot of people. And what's interesting is that many of my patients have come to me and said, wow, I feel so much better because I haven't been drinking over this last month. And visibly, many of them, you can see they've got clearer skin, they look lighter, they look brighter. Um, and so it's, it's just something to think about. Um, the same goes with smoking. I mean, we all know that this is probably the worst thing that you can do for your health in general is to smoke. But it's also one of the most difficult things to stop if you've been a regular smoker. Um, and generally, you need a bit of support to do that. But to quit smoking is one of the best things that one can do for long-term health, well-being, longevity. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. So this one, hormone replacement therapy, this is for women, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, reduces all cause mortality when we start early. We went through a couple of hours of this in our last sessions. If you didn't catch them, go ahead and watch them on YouTube. We talk about all the studies and all the benefits and also the risk associated with it as well. Okay, so now moving into keeping your mind active and learning new things. Just at a, at a high level, we know that when someone is has their mind stimulated, they are doing, whether it's crossword puzzles or learning something new or still running some business, they're, they're keeping their mind active and they, their cognition, their memory function is better. So, and it's shown in the studies as well, they have, I think a 40% less likelihood of Alzheimer's, free of dementia and conditions like Alzheimer's disease. So really essential to keep your mind active. Now, most people in midlife don't have this problem. In fact, their mind is overactive. So this is really something where this is not the problem for everybody at this stage in life, but it can become a problem as we get older. Often when people retire, they don't do things that are as mentally engaging. And that's where that, that can start. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about stress. And these are just some of the signs that stress is overcoming you. And I wanna talk about, um, I don't just wanna talk about the stressors because everyone has stressors of different magnitudes at different points in time in our life. But when you start to see that stress may be overcoming you, some of these are actually stressors, but the real issue is in our stress response. It's how we respond to stress, how resilient we are, how much that something could be going on and we are not consumed with that stressor. So if you feel triggered often, you've got road range, you're angry at your kids, you escape, whether it's social media, drinking, smoking, um, you've got sleeplessness, you've got regular dis discontent, you've got some health symptoms, imbalances, stomach problems. Now, hormonal imbalance is not always because of stress, but for many people, especially for like in the premenopausal stage, not perimenopause, but even before, um, if there are hormonal imbalances, stress can also be one of the causes. Stomach problems, weight issues, you're sick more often. These are signals that the stress response is not working at 100%. And I just threw this in because your superpower can turn against you. Um, I help a lot of people who are overthinkers, overanalyzers, achievers, people, pleasers, perfectionism, and uh, always wanting to improve. And this can be, and there's so many other characteristics on, but I just I threw these in. Um, but all of this, if we overdo it, it leads to a lack of fulfillment and less joy. So these are some of the things that can be worked on because at the end of the day, we really didn't learn this skill. Most people didn't learn it when we were younger. It's how to manage your energy, how to respond to stress in different ways, how to process emotions. So I'll, I'll talk to some of these in a moment. So emotional suppression can have, you can have a higher risk for death, including death from cancer. And we know chronic stress can create all sorts of health issues like high blood pressure, um, clots, brain changes, anxiety, depression, addiction. Um, so we see in the studies that there is a strong correlation to people who are more resilient to stress and those that age well. And there's these three Ps from Martik Seligman, Seligman from the University of Positive Psychology. There is a university called Positive Psychology. And he says that the, the people who do not do these three Ps with any problem in their life are generally, they are aging better when they've done studies and they have a positive view of aging. So they don't personalize something. They don't believe that you know it's be happening all because of them doesn't mean that they blame everyone else and never take the blame, but it's just that they don't over um, dramatize it and make it all about them all the time. Pervasiveness, that affects everything. So if you have um, an injury, 
Does it affect everything that you're doing in your life? Now, sometimes when we get injured and we have that moment of self-sympathy and victimization, we can feel that way. But then over time, as we're progressing through that injury, we realize that there's so many other pieces to life, other aspects that it's not really affecting everything. And permanence, most things are not lasting forever. And so if we detach from these things, there is a positive response to aging. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about what increases health span, longevity, and aging. And so the other thing I want to mention here, um, just processing emotions. So when we've got an emotion, a lot of times, you know, anger, we, we sometimes we get mad and we express it in a way that may not be healthy. That is processing it, maybe not in the best, the healthiest way. The other, the flip side of that is completely um, knowing that we're angry and then we're just distracting ourselves or we are, uh, we're shoving it down and we're not really addressing it. And we don't actually move through the emotion. And one way I like to think about this is if you think of a, uh, the old school parenting, which is, you know, if you're thinking about disciplining, a child gets shamed and shunned for doing something, they act it out. And then the parent says, why are you angry? Or why are you acting like this? You shouldn't be like this. And so they almost get, they, it creates self doubt because they're, it's almost like they're not allowed to feel the anger. And of course there's a behavior that's not acceptable, but they're not able to differentiate between the behavior and the feeling. And so that child wraps up the feeling and the behavior all together as one, and then thinks that that feeling is not acceptable. So then they grow up and we grow up. And a lot of us do that just by nature of being a child anyway, with what's acceptable in society and what's not, we think it's not acceptable to feel this way. And then we don't develop the skills to deal with those feelings because we have been told that behavior is wrong. And then you've got the flip side of, um, of a parent overcompensating and they don't want their child to feel sad at all. So then they distract them. They do everything in their power so the child doesn't feel a feeling. And then the child never grows up to actually process it. And a really nice, happy medium is where a parent sits there and still says, no, you can't have this thing because this is the boundary or that's the rule. But I'm here with you and I understand what it's like to be angry or sad and that's okay. And, and let me help you develop, you know, let me give you a, a way to deal with your anger. But we didn't, we didn't really grow up that way. Most generations, even until now are, some people are realizing this. And so this processing emotions in a really help, healthy way kind of helps you move through it and get over it. And it's not still sitting there as a trapped emotion or a trauma. So there's a lot of things there that, um, that be, can be improved and increase longevity. I think this is something that's really overlooked a lot of the time is that people struggle to identify how they are feeling and how those feelings impact on their mental and their physical health. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting is when people are expressing how they're feeling. You know, you can ask, well, in that situation, what did you feel? And then they'll rather describe the situation, but not identify the anger or the disappointment or the sadness or, or the, the core emotion. And one of the things that I find very helpful in my practice is to ask people to think carefully about what is that emotion? You know, give it a name so that you can see when you're in a situation, how do you really feel about it? Because if you find out what it is, then one can also cope with that in a, a more functional and um, appropriate way, you know? Yeah. And there's a whole practice that I like to do with my clients now. And, and sometimes it's not even identifying the feeling because sometimes people are not used to identifying and it's hard to know when they're not really feeling it. So when we go into a meditative state and sometimes it'll just be something where somebody says, I feel like there's a fire in my belly and we don't necessarily equate it to an emotion, but we work on processing that fire and allowing it. And eventually I had someone recently who, who told me they have a fire in their belly. And then just with a few sentences, that fire was gone, you know, and it's, it's about allowing. And then the emotions associated with it are also gone because then the person was much more relaxed. And so there are also different ways other than just head on using the mind to address the emotion. Sometimes it's, it's actually the somatic experience in the body. And that this is a, a really interesting and very, I almost find it's a much faster way to help people through those emotions is using this um, somatic body work as well. Okay. Connection. So we know, and, and if you've, I, I now see on TV, the blue zones, the guy who's been doing research on blue zones, he's now on, on um, Netflix, but blue zones are where the people, the people who are, have the, the zones where there are most hundred year, year olds and there are five zones in the world. And connection is one of the main pillars where they see people living the longest, 
Um, they have a strong connection with their family, friends. I've also put in higher power, whether it's God, spirit, um, universe, source, whatever you want to call it. Those that have that connection seem to have less stress and to have higher, longe uh, higher longevity. So there's a 50% greater risk of premature death for those people who are isolated. So versus those that have strong social connections. 7,000 people study over nine years found that the people who had more social ties lived longer, regardless of smoking, drinking, exercise, or obesity. I mean, obviously all those things are not the greatest, but social ties are so key, whether it's family or friends. And research has also shown that those who have a sense of connection to something bigger experience greater emotional well being and are happier, healthier, and live longer. Purpose is another one of the characteristic of the blue zones. And I really like this quote. Um, the meaning of life is to find your gift and the purpose of life is to give it away. It's Pablo Picasso. And then Mastin Kip has another one, which is also an interesting spin on it. He says, anyone you've ever admired was either consciously or unconsciously living on purpose. They had a reason beyond their circumstance to continue despite the conditions. They were connected to their inner power, strength, love, and compassion. Purpose is an emotion that you cultivate within yourself and give away to the world in the form of service to others. Now, I often find that purpose is not, um, it's not something that is always known, uh, especially in early stages in, in life, but for some people they already have, or it morphs over time. For others, I do help them with this, but I do work on self-love stuff first, which we'll talk about in a little bit, because sometimes it's about trusting yourself. And when you see, he says they were connected to their inner power, strength, love, and compassion. If someone has low self-esteem and basically low self-trust self, and they have a lot of self-doubt, it's going to be hard to find purpose. And so once people connect to this, they, they seem happier, they feel happier. And, and it's reported in observational studies that they do live longer with more meaning. Okay. So this is my all-time favorite graph ever. <laughs> so this is basically, this is where, where I think we were not taught in, in school, which is stress is is here we need a middle medium amount of stress if we don't have any stress we're actually feeling lazy and active and bored if we're overloaded we get to burnout breakdown sickness disease our performance is if we hit the highest performance and i would also wish this that energy as well we will have the most energy when we have this medium amount of stress what happens is we don't recognize and especially because i've been in burnout in and i, I love helping people with burnout is just to get them aware of where their body is. And I did put this little girl here because kids are great at telling you, especially babies, ah, they start crying when they're not happy. They are wonderful at telling you exactly what they need. They are not worried about if you're going to be upset with them, especially when they're babies, they're just giving you all the signs their body is telling. You. And over time we start to realize, okay, that's not always understood or appreciated. Or it's not the right time or too much and all these things. And then of course we need society there are benefits to having societal um, lines and, and things like that. But sometimes it becomes a box so much so that we stop listening to our body. And it's not only our energy. It's also if we eat something and we feel sluggish, if we eat something and our stomach hurts, if we get a headache um, on certain days, there's a, there's, these are signs that our body is telling us something. If we are um, having a negative emotion, which is also normal and, and fine and common to have a negative emotion, but if we are not processing it in the right way and something feels off and we don't know what to do with it, there is something our mind, body, and soul are trying to tell us. And this is what I love to help people become really attuned to is what their body is telling them, because this is actually how we can optimize this human experience and be and optimize the vessel that we were given in this lifetime is to really understand what it's trying to tell us. I think you can't separate your body and your mind. Um, and a lot of the times, like especially Western medicine, we we look at symptoms, we look at diagnosis, we look at treating, you know, the, the physical manifestations. But there is a huge connection between what's going on in your mind and in your soul and what's happening in your body system. And it is true that if you can develop that intuition and definitely pay attention to the signals that your body is giving you, this is powerful. And it can certainly help you reach optimum health, but also prevent issues from coming in later. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. So being sensitive is also okay. 
So this is also something that has come up in the last few years, especially, and it was always there, but now I see how much this is really the basis for so many people's health issues and stress levels and anxiety, lack of self-love. And I'll explain what I mean by self-love creates a high source of stress and is also the root cause of many addictions and most eating disorders. So when they've done studies, they show that the vulnerability factor of eating disorders and binging is actually low self-esteem. And then there's a trigger event that happens, maybe something that kind of activated you not feeling good about yourself. And then over a few, few certain things happen and that ends up leading to a binge. And often when you look at other addictions as well, this is the root cause. Um, so lack of, sorry, I know this is confusing, but lack of self-love, here's the evidence-based benefits of that. So better mental health, more acceptance, higher self-esteem, more motivation, stronger determination, increased self-awareness, less anxiety, and better sleep. So when I say self-love, what I mean is that someone is talking positively to themselves. They're not beating themselves up all the time. They actually trust themselves. They don't have a lot of self-doubt. Now it's normal as humans sometimes to just to not be sure on something, but not have it excessively where you're always doubting yourself and wondering, uh, maybe even wondering what others think of you. You're not giving power to other people's views, comments, or concerns. And obviously we want to honor the people in our life and we want their opinions, but so many people who have low self-esteem and low self-acceptance and low self-trust, they actually form the view of themselves based on others and not on themselves. And so this is not only about giving power to what someone thinks of you, but also giving power to external things, because there's so many milestones in life that we think if we do this, it's going to make us happy. If we make this much money, if we have this status, all these things, and we tick all the boxes and we're still not feeling that fulfilled. And it's because we're giving those external things so much power and not the power, the inner strength that we have, or the God-given power that we have, or the relationship with God. So there's, there's a little bit of intertwinement that comes with those, but, and also self-love is listening to your energy and not only listening to it, but accepting it and respecting it and listening to your physical needs, listening to your emotional needs, and also having a balance of pleasure. A lot of the religions teach that you, you have to suffer all the time. And while I'm not promoting to be hedonistic all the time, but there is a balance where some people just work so hard and they suffer so much and they actually suffer needlessly. And so there is a balance there that, that needs to happen when somebody truly loves themselves. So I'm going to go to this one now. <laughs> I think just on that previous point, um, the, the one thing that is extremely toxic is guilt. And I think most of us are guilty of feeling guilty for unnecessary things. Um, and that can be very detrimental to how you're feeling. And the more you feel that way, the less you progress through whatever kind of um, pathway or journey you're going on. So to be aware of not feeling guilty for doing things that make you feel good and happy and strong um, and that give you that sense of enjoyment for yourself. Amen to that. I mean, we're not talking promoting selfishness here or anything like that. It's just that a lot of people give so much to others and they really deprioritize themselves and there needs to be a better balance of that. And, and yes, without feeling, without feeling guilty as well. And sometimes it's just guilt is usually the definition of guilt is regretting something you did. And the reason why we have the guilt is so that we're motivated not to do it again. There's a reason for that emotion, but then also guilt the, the word guilt is also used for absorbing someone else's emotion or potential emotion. Like I feel bad. I'm not spending enough time with my kids, for example. And either because you just feel like you should be doing something, but it's about also aligning your priority because if you actually know you're a good mom and you're spending the right amount of balance time, it's okay. And if your kid is giving you a hard time, it's also about you explaining that to them. So there's a whole, uh, I could spend hours <laughs> talking about this as well, but it's your spot on Dr. Karen, because this is a huge one. And just, just for everyone, before you start with this one, I think we've only got a few, a uh, few minutes left. So if you stay on, we'll, we'll cover, we'll cover the rest. So leading on from not feeling guilty, it is important to focus on your own health and well-being. And this is something that I often see is that moms will bring their kids, they'll send their husbands, you know, and they're like, oh, please check him out. I'm worried about this or that or the other. And then she's collapsing in the corner, you know. Um, and I think it's important that we do take a little bit of cognizance of our own health and take care of ourselves. So one of the things that we advocate, especially during the midlife, is to do your routine medical checks because being proactive and preventive is definitely much better than dealing with issues once they are fully established and then you've got to manage a health crisis. 
So from about the age of 45, we recommend that you have an annual physical examination where we look at your personal history, your family history, looking out for any kind of health risks, obviously physical examination with the main things like your vital signs, routine blood work, et cetera, so that we can pick up on issues. And for women entering into the menopause and considering hormone therapy, there are certain things that we have to do. So we've got to check and see that your cardiovascular risk is nice and low. We've got to check and see that your breasts are healthy and we've got to have a look at your bone density so that we can understand what would be the benefit potentially of taking hormones versus the potential risks. Um, and so, you know, I think very important just to be aware that if you are heading towards the middle age, it's important to have your routine checks probably once a year. Okay, I, I did lie because I thought that this was going to be quick. I have so much on supplements. I think this needs a lot more time uh, to, to cover all the supplements in detail, but what we do see vitamin D3 and now K, um, K combined with D3 uh, is, and I say now K because most people were taking vitamin D, um, is generally helping most people. With that said, in part of your annual check, it's good to get your vitamin D levels checked because you can't have vitamin D toxicity and everyone has different absorption rates. So it is best to understand where you fall in the, that range and and then you will, based on what your doctor recommends, you will take a certain dosage of vitamin D at a certain interval that will likely benefit you. And then at some point, just get checked again to see if that dosage actually works for your body. And K is something that's very interesting because it has, um, it helps with the formation of blood clots. So a lot of people with heart disease will say, I don't want this, but it actually it helps move the calcium from, um, it, so in, rather than it's supposed to stay in your bones, but it moves it to different it prevents it from moving to different places. And it also helps with heart disease. And now they're finding that it is beneficial to, to take this low dosage, don't have to take it every day. And a lot of supplement companies, especially in the US are combining vitamin D and vitamin K. Omega-3, go ahead. Um, you know, especially for people protecting their bones, people used to take high doses of uh, calcium supplementation. And then they found that there was deposition of calcium in the blood vessels causing narrowing and plaques. And so the vitamin K helps to prevent that from happening. So it's important if you are taking a supplement specifically of calcium, we generally recommend now that you take vitamin K with that so that you don't get that excess calcification happen. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory. Most people can benefit from them. If you've had your DNA tested, you will see if you are more responsive to it or not, which for some people, it'll reduce inflammation more than others. Magnesium, in Mauritius, they don't have these forms. I haven't seen them, but glycinate and 3 and 8 3 and 8 is great for the brain. Glycinate is better for anxiety and sleep and for the, for the muscles as well. Um, these forms are better absorbed. They don't cause as many issues as the citrate does, but um, some people do need extra magnesium and that does help a lot of people. I'm not sure, Dr. Karen, if you have any comments on magnesium. I think most people are magnesium deficient. Um, and that's simply because our the quality of our fruits and vegetables is not the same as it would have been, let's say, 80 to 100 years ago. Um, and unfortunately, if you measure the magnesium in your bloodstream, which is what often happens, that will only give you an indication of how much magnesium is circulating in your blood. It doesn't give you an indication of the full body stores of magnesium. Um, and so, you know, often fatigue, headaches, sleep problems, muscle cramps, aches and pains, those are as a consequence of low levels of magnesium. Um, and so it's, it's one of those supplements that I prescribe almost daily because it really helps people to feel better. Right. Now, we won't have time to go through all the rest of the, the supplements, but what I will say, and I wrote individualized, most of them are individualized anyway, but for example, probiotics, benefit a lot of people, but for some people, it actually makes their IBS symptoms worse. So some people are deficient in some of these vitamins. Some people, will, they will benefit for hormones or for brain health or um, for anxiety, all, for you know, all sorts of things. But it really is dependent on your needs and what you're doing with your diet, what's going on with your health. So this, you know, it's not that one size fits all. The others were kind of benefit a majority of people. And then just because we were on the topic of hormones, postmenopausally, what's recommended by most experts are three main supplements. Um, and these are still postmenopausal, but also combined with individual 
So sometimes metformin is the pharmaceutical that's recommended to help with insulin resistance, but also myoinositol and or berberine have been, been shown in studies to support this as well. And it's been clinically trialed. Um, and there's some different ways you can you can experiment with these. It's good to also speak with your doctor and or a nutritionist or someone who's well-versed in these so they can help you with, with dosage and um, what to monitor when you take these. Creatine, also a women, when a woman's estrogen is reduced, she doesn't produce as much creatine. Women don't produce as much creatine anyway, but it helps with skeletal muscles, mood, cognition, and bone health when you're doing resistance training. So that is one that's often recommended postmenopausally to women. And then choline, also because of lower estrogen, this is one of the great thing, uh, one of the great vitamins that's, it's vitamin B4 that's produced and it's, it's high in, in egg yolk. You can get an egg yolk and pumpkin seeds and um, sun-dried tomatoes, a few of those types of foods. Um, but a woman postmenopausally will make less. And especially if she has, um, I wrote the SNP here, but there's a, uh, the PM, PEMT gene variant. And that means she's less likely to make here. Well, any person who has that variant will be less likely to make choline. So it may be one that they would need to supplement or make sure that they're having enough foods that have choline, because that's going to help with brain fog and cognition, just feeling sharp. And for a woman postmenopausally, that's going to go down anyway. Okay. Bonuses. I just, I'm not going to talk about all the details, but sauna, um, sometimes the wearables, sauna is great. It's, it's similar to exercise. So if you can't exercise, you have an injury or something, there's so many benefits to using a sauna. Wearables, sometimes wearables help people. I use the Aura Ring. I've been using it the last four years. Um, that is fantastic because it tracks your sleep. And for some people, they would say, well, that would make me worry all the time. And if, I actually think it helped me sleep better. Um, because sometimes I would worry that I wasn't sleeping well enough and it would, it would always give me good scores, but I could tell if I, if there was a, uh, a late night eating or a drink or different things, you can really start to see the habits and how it affects your REM and your deep sleep. And it also attracts your activity level. So there's smartwatches. Continuous glucose monitor, monitor is fantastic. If you have um, high blood sugar or you're watching your weight or there's you're concerned about blood sugar, these are expensive and they're newer. To use, but it is a fantastic way to change food habits. So you're not having your insulin and your blood sugar spike frequently. Other things, sunshine, wear sunscreen. So you don't want to get burned mm -hmm. or <laughs> create other issues. Nature, grounding, cryotherapy is getting in a cold chamber or cold showers. There's some benefits to that. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. There's a ton of things there. So I want to ask, oh, one more thing before I ask. Everyone needs an individualized roadmap, whether you create your own or you work with someone to do it. We need to create awareness of where we're at, where our body's at, what's what's happening, how our body responds to certain things, our unique body, mind, soul combination, just being aware of that and accepting it. And then aligned action on anything you want to change just to get very focused and not having to change everything or feel scattered, but really take the actions you need to have that roadmap to better health and longevity. So I want to ask for those that have joined, I know a lot of people are going to be watching the replay because they've sent me messages. What is your favorite takeaway from today? So just go ahead and write that in the chat. I know we've gone over today. So thank you for your patience. Let's see. Okay. Let me know if there's any specific thing that you learned or you want to focus on. For me personally, I mentioned something when Dr. Kyron was going out, but the one thing I really want to focus on is that functional movement support because I've had recurring um, back injuries from a snowboarding accident. It's about really working on getting that expert to help me understand my either muscle imbalances or um, you know, if there's something I'm doing wrong in my functional movement. Uh, remember Dr. Kyron when the exercise physiologist, Michelle from Australia was here, she was fantastic. So I'm looking, holding out for someone like her, <laughs> her in Mauritius. Okay. Debbie says supplements and sprinting. Yes. And the sprinting. This is so cool because, you know, if you don't have time to exercise, you can just do two or three sprints and it does have an impact. Okay. Well, I think, I think that's it for now. Any other questions? And someone else says tough one thought all of them were interesting. Possibly the latest research on exercise was interesting. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, so what I suggest is you circle one, you you work on that one, 
And we really hope that this has helped you give you an idea on what to do to increase your health span, to age optimally, um, to enhance your hormone balance as well. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. She says, I want to watch the second recording. Thank you. And we really appreciate it. And Dr. Karen, I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, your your presence, your support, your contribution, your wisdom in, in these last few sessions that we've had. So uh, it's been a pleasure once again. Thank you very much. It's always, I mean, it's an honor for me to, to join you. Um, and I, I really appreciate being part of these kind of interactive sessions. It means a lot. Thanks. Oh, excellent. You are welcome. Such a pleasure. And to all of you who joined live, thank you so much. And if you're watching the replay, thank you so much to your heart and your health span. You guys take care. Blessings. Blessings, Dr. Karen. Blessings to you.